Why did you want to be an astronaut? In reality, I never took the decision to become an astronaut. It just happened. And the way it happened was uh, a coincidence. Obviously, since uh, I was a child, I always was thinking with great interest about flying aircraft or flying in space, but uh, I never thought it was uh, going to be any possible one day. Um, the way for me the opportunity arrived was through the Italian Air Force. In fact, I, I went to the academy, I became pilot here in the U.S., Reese Air Force Base, Lubbock, Texas, now the base is closed. That was the year 89, and then I came back in 95 at Pataxan River for the test pilot school. And at the end of the test pilot school, it is tradition that the school takes a tour at NASA, and I was with them. And I remember coming here uh, with uh, my class, my TPS class, and uh, all my colleagues, American colleagues, were thinking about becoming an astronaut, and I was thinking, bad luck that <laughs> I am not U.S. Obviously, in Italy, uh, it's not that easy to have uh, opportunities for astronauts. So differently from the U.S., where every other year or um, routinely you have a new class of astronauts, for us it's kind of very rare and unique opportunity. I never thought that uh, that opportunity would have been uh, available to me. Then I went back uh, after my TPS uh, test pilot school, I went back to Italy. And uh, two years later, here it is, the Italian Space Agency was looking for two astronauts. I applied and uh, I got selected together with my friend and colleague Paolo Nespoli. I want to take you back uh, to your childhood. Tell me about your hometown and, and what it was like for you growing up uh, in Italy. I grew up in a very small town, very, very small. Uh, the name is Bomarzo. Bomarzo, in its original, uh, originally the name meant City of Mars. <laughs> Um, very small, in the middle of a beautiful uh, forest in the countryside, and I grew up playing soccer outside my, my school. I was uh, very good in defense, and, uh, and, that was, uh, uh, and, and then I, was, I, I loved to play in the woods with my, my friends, um, and that, that has been my, my childhood. Um, then when I, um, I uh, reached the age of the decision uh, after after my high school, I decided to uh, in, to start to study physics. So I left my small town uh, that uh, remains uh, every time in my in my uh, thoughts. And uh, my parents still live there. And uh, uh, as a coincidence, there is a very uh, in, in the Italian cities, especially those small cities, there is a tradition. Um, there is one special day that is the, the festivity of the city. And that special day is the 24th of April. My first space flight I flew in April, exactly around the 24th, so the second. Mm -hmm. Apparently, <laughs> I will fly in April also for STS-134. And that obviously keep me very much linked mm -hmm. with my origins. Did you get a chance to see it from space on your previous flights? That is a good question because uh, the, the, my uh, city, my, my so small that is uh, impossible <laughs> to clearly identify it. I was able to identify other geographical contour and take a picture in the middle hoping to <laughs> get uh, my small village in it. Unfortunately, the clouds. Uh, didn't succeed, so I will get another try this time. Do you have a feeling that that place and those people there helped make you the person that you are today? I spent 18 years uh, in, uh, in, that, in that little town, and uh, obviously I bring with me uh, many lessons learned from my childhood, playing uh, in the woods, staying in the middle of uh, the, the nature, and uh, something that I, I, I believe I brought with me in space is uh, to um, assess 
this very strange sensation in comparing technology with uh, nature, in uh, judging or pondering the future with the past. And uh, obviously, to start from a small village and uh, go for this very special path that got me through the uh, Italian uh, Air Force to become a pilot and then a test pilot and then the Italian Space Agency, European Space Agency, an astronaut to fly to the International Space Station to have an opportunity to see the Earth from space and then to land, to go back, to go back to the small village, to, to go back to the origin. Obviously, all this is making to feel you a very strong uh, motivation to continue to look for the future, to build the future for, for, for myself, for my uh, children, for all of us, but uh, also a very strong feeling and sensation of the importance of who we are and uh, all the little things that are, are around us and sometimes we don't uh, uh, properly evaluate. So I, 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 I will continue to work for, uh, for, for the future, uh, bringing and taking with me every time my, my roots and my origins. The part of your job that you're about to, to take on, the flying in space part of being an astronaut, is a part that we know can be dangerous. So Roberto, I'm interested to know what is it that you think that we get or what do we learn as a result of flying people in space that makes it worth taking that risk? Risk is, uh, is uh, I, I link the word risk with probability. Um, there is a probability of something that could go wrong, anything that you do in life. Um, so I, I do not necessarily concentrate on the risk associated with space flight, especially because living with NASA, working with NASA, I see that uh, uh, the, the, there is a, a systematic uh, approach to protect uh, the, the safety of space flights and uh, I, 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 I would consider, I would be inclined to consider uh, this incredible effort of the NASA community as uh, uh, reducing the risk associated with space flight to, to the minimum possible. So I feel perfectly at ease in uh, uh, getting ready to climb on the, on the rockets, on the shuttle, and fly to the International Space Station with my crew. Roberto, you're a member of the shuttle mission STS-134's crew. Could you summarize the overall goals of your flight and tell me what your main responsibilities are going to be? 134, it's almost uh, unbelievable today uh, to realize that uh, I am here ready to fly on STS-134. In fact, um, there is a long story behind uh, my assignment that goes back with uh, my, uh, the, my origin. I was initially a student. Um, I was trying to get uh, a, a major in physics. And then at a certain point, I switched my uh, path, and I went and became a, a pilot, and then a test pilot with the Italian Air Force. But uh, my passion for physics continued all along. And uh, soon after I achieved my degree as a test pilot, I went back and completed my uh, degree at uh, the university. That was in Perugia. And I, I finished my studies. Um, and ironically, uh, my teacher was uh, a Professor Battiston, that is uh, the deputy chief of the AMS experiment. So after this long career, Air Force and then NASA, I started with NASA in 98. I find myself on uh, possibly what could be the last flight uh, and with on board the uh, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer that is uh, the merging of uh, my uh, passions, physics and uh, flying, flying aircraft and flying space. And in this case, you're going to the space station with this uh, European hardware. You're even going to arrive at the station and find a fellow European astronaut, a fellow a countryman, Paolo Nespoli, who's going to be there. Um, 
Do you have any thoughts about the significance of having two representatives of the European and the Italian space agencies? With Paola, you have another very peculiar and spe special coincidence. We started, in fact, together in 98. And uh, between the two of us, every time there was a competition. Uh, obviously, we were in the same class, both Italians, both on the same track. So the, <coughs> and the, the way things went, um, I uh, soon after completed my NASA training, I went and f I had the opportunity to fly in, in Russia. That was 2002. And then a second time in, uh, in Russia in 2005. Paul instead uh, had the privilege to fly with the shuttle on STS-120. And here we are switching sides. Now Paolo, as of we speak, is in Russia ready to launch on the, for his expedition. And uh, here I am uh, in line to fly on STS-134. And uh, we'll meet in space. That's unique. It's a beautiful opportunity. We started together and uh, we converged together on board of the station. And I probably shows the, the maturity of the European Space Program to now have two astronauts in space together. Obviously, the other um, situation that I like to underline is back in 98 when I got selected uh, was also the year that uh, the European Astronaut Corp was born. Uh, at that time, we were, if I recall correctly, 16, uh, many different nationalities. We have been working together. Now we have uh, 16 astronauts in the new class. Uh, and uh, obviously, to have the opportunity for the year 2011 to have uh, two European astronauts, both of Italian nationality, is something that uh, for sure makes me proud. One of the most important experiments that's being delivered to the space station, certainly on your flight, is the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which you referred to uh, a minute ago. Let me get you to, to fill that in for us. Tell me about the AMS and what it does in space. Alpha magnetic spectrometer for me <coughs> is obviously uh, has a very specific importance with my role in space. I will be R1. That means that uh, I will have the responsibility with uh, the shuttle robotic arm to take it from the payload bay and uh, offer it to the station. But uh, behind that specific operational task, there is a very long history. I started uh, studying physics. Not only that, my interest was antimatter. Antimatter is something very special. When matter and antimatter meet with each other, they know each other and they create a huge amount of energy. One of the most, uh, most deep secrets of the universe is why in our universe we see matter and not antimatter. With this in mind, uh, I started about 20, 25 years ago to study physics, to think about space, to think about the universe. And uh, the specific of the search of the antimatter was one of my main uh, and deep interests. It may appear as a, a very strange coincidence that today I will be the one to take this unique piece of hardware, take it from the bay of the shuttle and uh, give it to install on the, on the station. And throughout my studies, um, despite uh, my Air Force career got me more than once off track from studying physics. Mm -hmm. I always have remained with uh, this deep interest for the mystery of the universe. Something else that uh, I like to underline is uh, this unique piece of device that is IMS, Alpha Magnetic uh, Spectrometer. It is something that we don't know exactly what uh, will give it to us. In fact, he has flown already once back in, uh, if I am not mistaken, back in 1998. And uh, in that case, we could not find uh, any trace of antimatter. So the question remains whether we'll be able to find something this second time around, uh, keeping the experiment uh, for years in space, because when the first time AMS flew, it was only for the duration of the shuttle space flight. It was only for about two weeks. Now we'll have more time, and we'll, we'll be able to find trace of antimatter. And if not, maybe we can, we'll be able to unfold another, another uh, secret of the universe that currently our scientists are facing, what they call dark matter or dark energy. Uh, in simple words, apparently our universe is uh, not the, w the way we, it looks. 
if we do calculations of uh, motions of a galaxy, uh, there must be something else, some other uh, huge mass or huge uh, source of energy that we do not see, neither with uh, our eyes nor with our instruments. If that would be true, maybe AMS will be able to detect some of direct or indirect effect of the presence of uh, such energy and such a mass. And uh, looking into perspective, those are the real questions that uh, I hope we could give a contribution to unfold. How does AMS, how is it designed to do that? What does it do once you've installed it on the station? IMS uh, is uh, um, a very complex device that uh, has the capability to detect particles or antiparticles. When a particle goes through IMS, uh, there are a number of sensors and devices that are capable to recognize the type of particle, the energy, and uh, in then uh, uh, working on, uh, on, on that data, we will be able, the scientists, will, will, will be able to understand where this uh, particle was coming from and uh, uh, which kind of information is bringing to us after maybe many years or thousands of years of travel throughout the universe. So in other words, uh, uh, the AMS, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, uh, in a way could be compared uh, using a very uh, a simple image like, a, like maybe a lens. With a lens we can see what is very small. Uh, in a way, IMS is also a sort of lens that is capable to uh, give a, an identity, a name, an history, an interpretation to those small particles that are bombarding our planet from many distant places of the universe. Can you characterize for the non-physicists among us what is the significance of, of what it may find in, in searching for, for dark matter and antimatter? The significance is to start to have a little bit more awareness of who we are. One of the fundamental questions is uh, from where our universe is coming, uh, the Big Bang. Uh, if the Big Bang is true, why there is no symmetry between mother and antimatter? Uh, the other most more recent question is uh, if the universe is not uh, all that we see but there is something that is dark behind the scenes that we cannot see or measure, uh, what, what is the meaning of it? So those are very fundamental questions that uh, have, have a huge impact in uh, our understanding of who we are and where we are going. And AMS has quite a, a a strong European pedigree in terms of the hardware and, and the background of the experiment, doesn't it? IMS uh, obviously is under one name, same thing, Nobel Prize for Physics, and uh, he has been the leader of the first IMS and the second. Europe is giving, offering a huge, very significant contribution. Italy, if I am not mistaken, is one of the major contributors, maybe the second, uh, uh, and uh, obviously this is underlining um, our participation and contribution not only to the International Space Station but also to the science on board of it. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago that you will be the arm operator, the shuttle arm operator for the installation of AMS. Can you tell me a little bit more about the procedure for getting it out of the payload bay and installed up on the station truss? The procedure is very simple. The complexity is on how to operate the arm to achieve that objective. The procedure is simple. It's simply the AMS is in the bay, and uh, the arm operator, that is a mechanical arm, it just has the uh, responsibility to grab it. And then I release it, and then uh, I raise it up and offer to the International Space Station operator that, by the way, is uh, our pilot, is uh, Gregory Johnson, Box is nickname. He will be on the station side, he will be operating the station arm, so he will be some kind of a uh, uh, shake hands in space, and uh, I will be offering AMS, he will be taking it and installing it, installing on the, on the truss of the International Space Station. It's another symbolic, but uh, very, very much significant um, 
uh, picture, image, that uh, is underlining the cooperation in space. During this mission and your crew's time on the International Space Station, there'll be some spacewalks going on, there'll be cargo that'll be moving back and forth, a standard sort of, of mission profile that's laid out to, uh, to keep the International Space Station going on behalf of, of the international partners. And STS-134 is the last scheduled flight of shuttle Endeavour, the, your ship. Uh, what are your thoughts about this space shuttle's place in the history of human spaceflight and, and how the work of the shuttle program is going to be remembered? You mentioned EVA. I will not be involved in EVA. And uh, that's uh, a motivation for me to start maybe considering something else for, for my, my future. <laughs> I have had already two space flight opportunities on the Soyuz. Looking forward to fly on the shuttle, I have uh, not never done an EVA. So uh, thinking about uh, my, my possible future, obviously that will be uh, a unique experience that I, maybe I would have a chance in the future to, to try myself. Thinking about the shuttle, the future of the shuttle, um, we all know that uh, the STS-134 may be one of the last, if not the last, space flight. And uh, I, I, I feel, in a, in a way, missing something when I, when I start thinking about the shuttle retiring. Because the future, I am a pilot and a test pilot. The future of flying aircraft cannot be uh, anything else than flying higher and faster, similarly to what the shuttle is doing. So future hypersonic aircraft and spacecraft will very much be similar to the way the shuttle is, similar to the way the shuttle flies. So in seeing the shuttle retiring without uh, seeing what comes next, uh, seems that uh, it's missing something. Uh, so I look with anticipation to read on the newspaper to uh, the future projects that uh, I know that are all there. We know how to fly hypersonic aircraft in uh, aerospace or in space. And uh, I, I feel that uh, time is mature to uh, go beyond uh, the 15,000 feet and uh, the typical speed of a current aircraft. Um, I look with anticipation with the day the transportation future de generation will, uh, will, will arrive and uh, the retiring of the shuttle is only a temporary interruption of uh, uh, a very exciting future that uh, is about to happen. While we've got you on the subject of history, we also note that you'll be flying this mission in roughly the same period of time as the 50th anniversary of the first human space flight by Yuri Gagarin as well as the 30th anniversary of the first space shuttle flight. Uh, what are your thoughts about being on orbit yourself so close to these milestones in human space flight? Um, you know, it's a, uh, there, there are, it's a mixed feeling. If you think about you are in space on such important uh, anniversary, in a way, you have a sensation that uh, time goes by very, very, very quickly. On the other side, you look at the future with excitement, because 50 years is nothing. And therefore, if we try to judge what, how huge are the progresses that we have done in the last 50 years, and you project yourself to the next 50 years, I have three kids. And uh, obviously, I continue to try to motivate them to be involved in technology and space because uh, that's my future, their future, the future of humanity. Let me ask you about that 50 years in the future then. If, if we've come this far in the past 50 years, where do you think we will be 50 years from now? My personal bet is on uh, aerospace, as I was saying. I would be inclined to consider uh, the next technological breakthrough uh, to allow for engine capability and uh, flying capability for machines to become hypersonic vehicles, so to reduce time uh, to go from one place to the other of Earth, uh, increase options for commercial initiatives 
uh, back and forth from the low Earth orbit, something that we are already witnessing. And uh, that, that would be the area where I would personally be most interested in, and uh, I would be personally concentrating my, my mental energy and my, my resources. Obviously, I also look with great interest anything that goes moon and beyond, but uh, I, if I would have to take a pick and make a choice, uh, as a pilot, as pilot, I will concentrate on the hypersonic part.